If I could now invite uh, Dr. Adam Roberts to, um, to load his presentation, please. Um, Dr. Adam Roberts is a reader in antimicrobial chemotherapy and resistance at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. He's been investigating the fundamental mechanisms of transferable antimicrobial resistance for more than 20 years, and more recently has focused on more translational aspects of AMR and early stage drug discovery and development. And today, uh, Adam's gonna talk to us about citizen science drug discovery, um, updates from swab and send. Adam, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Can you hear me okay? I can, yes, thanks. Thank you. And thank you very much to the organizers as well for giving me the opportunity to uh, give an update on um, what really was uh, a very small project, uh, which is growing a little bit larger, as you shall see as I update you today. So new drugs and citizen science and public engagement, just a very quick sort of justification of why I'm interested in it. And if it's new, it's not. Antibiotic discovery is rooted in citizen science. This is really evidenced by um, Penicillium chrysogenum, which was found on a moldy cantaloupe melon um, in the USA. And that strain replaced the original Penicillium, not Penicillium notatum strain that was the producer of penicillin. So citizen science is really rooted in drug discovery. And there are multiple projects which have gone before Swab and Send uh, looking at this. It's also important that we increase awareness of AMR and the issues surrounding the difficulties in finding new antibiotics. I think if people know how ridiculously difficult it is to bring a new compound to medicine as an antibiotic, people would take more care of them. And this societal understanding of their value and behavior um, is important. And the behavior change of the public and people who use antibiotics, such as veterinarians, people in the food industry, and also clinicians, is one of the multiple prerequisites for solution of the AMR problem. And it will stop people sort of thinking along these lines. And this is just a tweet from a few years ago showing two relatively common misconceptions about what antibiotics actually do. So swab and send, I'm sure some of you have heard about it. It's a citizen science project that I started in 2015 while I was at University College London. And this is just an overview of what happens in the project. Individuals hear about it, usually on the dedicated Facebook project website, where all of the results from the project from its inception are presented. And also on Twitter with the hashtag swab and send. Individuals have to pay to play because we're, nobody's really made of money. So individuals pledge a small amount to take part and they currently pledge 30 pounds for five swabs. If there's lots of multiples, for example, we have some families taking part and we can reduce the cost. Or if people are from resource limited settings, and this includes individuals and schools with no budgets, then we can waive the charge on an ad hoc basis. And they can donate either online or by sending a check to the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. Um, and just to highlight, this would be a very unusual Christmas present. Once pledges have been, um, money has been pledged, we send out the swabs. We've sent them all around the world, predominantly to the UK. And then participants get swabbing and they can really swab whatever they wish or whoever they wish. We do state on the information sheet, please do not swab animals or humans. Um, and that's purely for safety reasons, but nobody takes a blind bit of notice. And we get a huge and inexplicable overrepresentation of cats, which is unusual. All the swabs are returned. Here you can see a large amount of swabs from an activity that the uh, Northern Ireland branch of the British Medical Association ran um, about 18 months ago. And then we take them to the laboratory and we analyze them microbiologically. And we also do events, um, pop-ups, and this is us at the um, Excel Center in London for the New Scientist Festival in Science Festival in 2018. Um, and this was generously funded by the Society for Applied Microbiology. And here we unveiled our tower of swab, which was basically a two meter high giant swab containing other swabs in a double helical structure um, where we sampled the festival. And there was some interest in microbes that we found from there. And that generated a lot of interest. In addition, the car park at LSTM was dug up 
um, about 18 months ago. And the obvious thing to do is therefore go and swab the finds that the archaeologists are pulling out of the ground. Here's us at the new um, the Science Museum in London at the Science Lates Festival. And also during lockdown, we found an innovative way to keep people interested, which was by asking them to make Winogradsky columns um, in their gardens and houses. And then when they've matured, such as these, they were swabbed as well. And those are being returned to us now. So there's a lot of different activities that we use to keep people interested in the microbiology and also in the discovery of antibiotics. So what do we do? Well, the swabs are plated out onto brain heart fusion agar. Uh, and this is 4% agar. We use that high concentration of agar to prevent swarming bacteria taking over the agar plates. We choose BHI because we've generally got the most diverse results from using BHI. We have tried others such as Severod agar to look for fungi and most of the swabs contain fungi as well. And also we uh, noticed that the uh, ingredients of chicken gravy was pretty similar to BHI, so we tried it out. And you can see here that we get a good uh, return. And this might sound like a bit of fun, it generated some interest on the project website, but actually this is quite important for resource limited settings that can't afford 80 pound pots of brain heart infusion. But you can still carry out microbiology with a bit of gravy. So what we actually do is to take every single individually um, individual morphologically distinct colony, and we put it in a microtiter plate well. We prefer to duplicate our picks rather than miss anything out. So sometimes you see series of individual isolates which have very similar zones of inhibition, um, and that's fine because, as you'll see, we triage those later. These are stored assay ready as glycerol stocks in the freezer, and currently we're in the tens of thousands of these as our sort of natural environmental isolate library. When we're ready to screen, we use our um, hedgehog here to inoculate agar plates. Again, brain heart infusion, 4% agar. And we have a no indicator control, so we know that our isolates have survived the freezing process. And then we replica plate these onto agar plates, which have been previously inoculated with our indicator strains. And you can see here, this is an indicator strain. Micrococcus luteus, and this indicator strain is E. coli. And you can see, and this is usual, there are many zones of inhibition with a micrococcus because it's a bit of a wimp in terms of its cell wall. Antibiotics and antimicrobial compounds can get in there quite easily. E. coli is a lot more difficult, um, as you'll see when we discuss the pipeline a little bit later. And those results are uploaded onto the Facebook page. And then these phenotypic results really represent the end of our contract with the participants who have pledged. That's the end of our work with the public. And we discuss it if they wish, and they find it interesting. And we do get actually returned customers as well. And all we, we sometimes get entire families who want to swab off, which is quite interesting. So what do we do in the lab after this? Because obviously there's a serious note to it. You know, it would be great if we could find something that we could use in medicine. So we take the hits, and currently we're looking at hits against E. coli and the candida species. And then we put these into an individual spe species specific pit stop. So we have a microtiter plate, apologies, we have a microtiter plate with all the hits that we found. These are then frozen down and we repeat the process on the agar plate, okay? Because what we've seen is that we have a drop off in activity. And we think, based on some work which was funded by the BBSRC on elicitor molecules, that the proximity of different colonies on the original plates can affect the production of antimicrobials from neighboring colonies. So that means that we need something which is repeatable in a different environment on that plate. So this triage is quite a lot of the isolates. So the ones that come through this. They go into our cell-free filter sterilized supernatant assays where they're spun down, put through a filter, and then we carry out the assays in a clario star so we can detect any changes in growth throughout the entire growth phase of the bacterium rather than using endpoint. Okay, so initially starting off with whole cells, we then go into the cell-free supernatants. And this is just because we need something which is easy to isolate and identify. And in order to do that, 
we will have iterative rounds of fractionation. And I've put a little sort of exclamation star around this because we'll come back to this particular aspect in a moment. In terms of genomics, <clears throat> what we also do is sequence things which we think are interesting because we are curious after all, and also things which come through the cell-free supernatant assays with exceptional activity. And we use both long and short read sequencing. So long read sequencing we do in house and short read sequencing, we send the isolates off to Microbes MG in Birmingham. And this allows us to have confidence in our strain identification. It allows us to carry out comparative genomics to detect biosynthetic gene clusters and also initiate spin-off projects um, when things don't progress down our antimicrobial pipeline, such as this particular Klebsiella grimontii isolate, uh, which was isolated from a reusable water bottle from the journalists at the Telegraph. And it appears to contain the entire biosynthetic gene cluster for the cytotoxin Klebexomycin, which was quite new and interesting. So, our lead isolates against E. coli. I'm just going to share a little bit of data that we've got quite recently. So within the plate reader, we can detect all of the growth at whatever time interval we wish. Obviously, we carry these out in triplicate, and each biological triplicate contains at least three technical replicates. So you can see the error bars are quite... Um, uh, the error bars are, make the graph quite confusing to look at, so we'll just remove those for the uh, remainder of the talk. So I'm also going to expand the top because it's quite confusing. So if we just look at this bit, I just want to show you the controls that we incorporate into this. And there are two. <coughs> so one control is 198 microliters of brain heart infusion broth plus two microliters of our E. coli that we use. And this is E. coli NCTC86, <coughs> excuse me, which was supplied free by uh, the NCTC, um, specifically for the Swab and Seb project. So thank you for that. Now, what we also do when we have the cell-free supernatant of our Swab and Send isolates is effectively dilute the brain heart infusion. So another control that we include is 98 microliters of the BHI broth plus 100 microliters of a filter sterilized E. coli supernatant, just to try and mimic as close as we can the dilutive effect of adding cell-free supernatant from the swab and send isolates. And you can see here, therefore, we get a range of growth from our control plates. So therefore, we're interested in things which prevent the growth underneath this second control. And the interest that we have is proportional to the difference compared to the controls. Now, those eagle eyed amongst you will have already seen probably this particular um, data series here. So we have one well and one isolate, which seems to prevent the growth completely of our NCTC86 strain. Just to mention the NCTC86 strain is the strain of E. coli, which was deposited by Theodore Escheris himself. So this predates antibiotic use on an industrial scale. Now this particular isolate was SS975, and this was found in Jackie's external and very old coal scuttle in 2019. And at the time, actually on the Facebook page, we did state that we were extremely interested in this particular isolate. And at this time it was just stored in the hip plate and we wait until the hip plate is full before we carry out the cell-free supernatant assays, just because it reduces the workload. And it reduces the workload because the resources for this project are quite limited. This is the kind of stuff we do after hours, okay? There is, until recently, no specific grant funding for it. So this blue arrow here shows the particular isolate that we're interested in, SS975. And you can see here, it has activity against the E. coli, which is great, that's what we want. It also has activity against MRSA. Candida auris here and also obviously Micrococcus luteus. So what is it? So we quickly did a 16S, uh, sent it off for sequencing. It showed that it was um, Penibacillus polymixa, 100% ID over the sequence region of the 16S gene. And most of you will probably know that uh, Penibacillus polymixia is the natural producer of polymixins, which is a bit of a letdown, but not totally unexpected. All of this early work is to de 
dereplicate finding things that we've already found um, in terms of antimicrobials. So the next easy thing we wanted to address was what is the spectrum of activity? So we put together a collection of strains in the laboratory containing different resistance genes um, and some which have got phenotypic resistance, but we haven't yet sequenced. And these included two colistin resistance strains of E. coli, which contain MCR1 and MCR2. <clears throat> and then if we look at the cell-free supernatant assays against these strains, again with the two controls, one not diluted and one diluted, we can see that whatever this SS975 is producing is active against multiple strains apart from the colistin resistant ones. So it looks like it is actually going to be a polymyxin. What was interesting in this as well is that this particular Klebsiella pneumoniae, so this is the carbapenem resistant strain which is currently being sequenced, um, seemed to uh, evolve rapidly resistance against this presumably polymyxin compound. So we appear to have isolated a polymyxin producing Pinobacillus polymyxa. The long read sequences for this genome are currently being base called. It finished about two days ago. And the short reads are being processed by microbes NG as we speak. And the hybrid assembly, which we'll carry out, will reveal the true nature of the likely polymyxins being produced. And these genomics are needed for us to make a go no go decision on any more work that we carry out with SS975. And it could be that. Once we have this genome sequence, actually there's evidence of other antimicrobials being produced by the strain, and it's not just, not just the polymyxin, which we think is being produced. Uh, one of the indications for this is that the zone of inhibition is quite large in some other assays, and polymyxins are quite a large molecule, so diffusion through the agar, especially 4% agar, is probably going to be quite limited. We might find out that the... Um, the genetics for the production of the polymyxin are uh, unusual. And this may mean that it's a variation or it has increased, uh, sorry, decreased toxicity to human cells. So that's something we will assess when we have the um, genomic data. And then if it does look like it's a go, then we can also start to derivatize um, into a new series of this polymyxin. If it's a no-go decision, then it becomes a group project with the aim of publishing details of the genome or anything else that we find interesting in there. And this is quite nice as the team building exercise because the entire group gets to contribute. But what it does do, I think, is validates our experimental setup of swap and send. <clears throat> so we have confidence that we can find what is out there against our indicator strains. Now, <clears throat> there are many other isolates that we've got. The next one that we're interested in is SS1099. And this was isolated from a birdhouse. And we've just got the data back showing that this is probably a serratia. And again, this will go through um, iterative testing to look at the uh, spectrum of activity against different strains. And the genome for that is expected to come back also within a month. We also have hit plates against Candida auris. So again, this is our initial data from the first um, hit plate that we've run. I've removed the error bars again. And this is the spectrum of activity that we have with the controls. So anything down here, we are quite interested in. Although we don't see anything as good as this particular um, effect that we saw with the E. coli screen. So we have other multiple hit plates, um, other multiple target species with which we can carry out. So we have quite a lot of work to be carrying on with. So our pipeline at the moment currently looks like this. I've put the indicator strains along the top. Um, just to comment that we've probably examined now about 5,000 swabs. And there's also soil samples from Jenny Shelton's citizen science project, summer solstice coming through. So we've got maybe upwards of about 20,000 isolates in our library to get through. Our initial hits are more than 500 active against Micrococcus luteus. 100 against Staph aureus, and then around 60 and 50 against E. coli and the Candida species, respectively. We're not doing anything with these at the moment. Micrococcus luteus is great for photographs for the website. It's nice and yellow and you get defined zones. Staphylococcus aureus isn't where we want to be at the moment in terms of what we're focusing on. But the E. coli and other Enterobacteriaceae and the Candida are our focus. 
So with the cell free hits, they've currently got seven and eight respectively against E. coli and Candida auris that we're looking at, that we've, uh, we still continue to work on. And in terms of genomics, we've got one against Candida auris, which is a Pseudomonas species, which looks quite new, and it doesn't contain any biosynthetic gene clusters which can explain its activity against the candida. So this is probably our most promising one at the moment. It should be mentioned as well, though, that this actually bypasses cell-free hits, and the cell-free hits are being carried out early next year. So this was inverted just due to activities that were ongoing in the laboratory. And all of this um, data that we have from the project so far is summarized in this editorial that um, I got published earlier this year in Future Science Open Access. <clears throat> now, finally, I just want to talk about the re relevant recent funding that we've um, obtained, because I think this represents a um, opportunity for collaboration. So the project started in 2015, and quite a few people have said to me that, Swan sends, that's a good idea. I think I might try that. I would advise people not to go into something like this without thinking seriously about the funding because it's not an insignificant task to run a project like this um, for five years without a major funding stream. So what has supported the project so far are pledges from the public, probably around about 5,000 pounds, pledges from uh, and grants for events that we've run, about eight and a half thousand. As uh, NIHR, research prize that I won in 2015, which kept us going for a bit. When I moved to LSTM in 2017, there's, um, there was a lot of institutional support, which is priceless. I can't actually put a, um, a, a cost on this because the project wouldn't be carrying on without that institutional support. And then there were little pieces of money um, from various sources that we applied for throughout the years, um, including this NIHR AMR capacity building grant, which enabled us to buy the plate regions, which um, really sped up the activity that we could do. Whilst these, this equipment wasn't specifically for swab and send, it's aligned to it. So we could use the machines for that particular aspect. As is the case for the Burn Sunley Foundation donation for our incubators. And then finally, and recently, we've got a small amount of money for an educational project with some schools in the north of England. So you can see that all these bits of money, uh, it's a bit patchy in terms of its coverage over the lifetime of the project, but it keeps it going um, almost like a hobby. However, recently, we were very lucky enough to get the Strength in Places funding. So the Strength in Places funding has enabled us to form the ICON or the Infection Innovation Consortium throughout the Northwest of England. Uh, and this has brought around about 3 million to me and my group for a project which will involve Swab and Send. And this is part of a larger funding from the UKRI of about 16.8 million, uh, which itself fits into a 116 million pound package of funding over the next five years for work uh, for therapeutics and diagnostics in the infectious disease space. So this has really guaranteed the longevity of the project. And what we plan on doing with this is to expand the natural isolate library that we currently have through Swab and Send into a modular resource which will be available to industry and academic partners for screening. So these will be natural isolates, they will be cell-free supernatants, and they will be fractions of cell-free supernatants. And what it also does is provides me with the funds to purchase all of the equipment needed for the fully functional fractionation suite at LSTM. So if you remember from one of the early slides, this is the part of the puzzle that we were missing in order to be able to do pretty much everything in-house, going from swab to compound ID. And what rather wonderfully as well, it includes um, a module of work looking at our anti-candida RS activity. So we've now got five years of funding to carry on the work with our anti-candida hits, which I think is great news. And at the end of 2023, what we hope to do is roll out this library as a small medium enterprise 
where collaborative partners can come and they can screen what we have. Obviously, it's a cost because it needs to be a self-sustaining entity in the future. So that's good news. So to conclude, Swab and Send has become a self-sustaining, both in terms of interest and finance, long-term crowdfunded citizen science project with the ability to reach a very wide audience in terms of the public. It's resulted in multiple bacterial isolates of genuine scientific interest. Also one of the most, possibly most diverse and one of the largest environmental isolate collection in the UK, possibly Europe. And this will greatly expand over the next couple of years. And it's also resulted in numerous collaborations and further funding opportunities. Um, and obviously we welcome more as well. And because we've got that recent funding, we are also recruiting. So if uh, people are on Twitter and you have a look at my Twitter feed pinned to the top are the details of a research technician post, two research assistantships and a postdoctoral research associate position, which we want to appoint to by March next year. So please feel free to get in touch if you're interested. <clears throat> Finally, it wouldn't be possible to carry out this project without a wonderful group behind me who do most, if not all of the lab work, and particularly Miss Isra Bulgasim, Miss Ellie Ullman and Dr. Ellie Wright, who have been beavering away in the LSTM laboratories at all times of the day, processing all these swabs that come in from all over the world and providing this resource that we can build on now. I'd also like to thank these individuals from UCL, Liam and Kimmy, Julie from the NCTC and Claire from MWE Medical Wire. They have been wonderful in providing us with uh, swabs to offset the cost in terms of what is pledged so we can use it for the microbiology. And then finally, all of these funders um, who over the years have made this project possible. And then I leave you with that. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Adam. That was really, really great.